going to start with two quotes that impressed me, uh, that really, um, what, these two quotes are like epiphanies for me. You know, a book drops open and you start reading it, or you online and you see something that you really like. I, I'm really open to lots of things that I see out there. I'm not trying to shut down my, my learning. But in the late 19th century, John Stuart Mill commented on the powerful tendency for individuals to give life to abstract concepts, treating them as if um, they have an independent reality. Uh, they infuse them with a range of attributes and powers, he says, and even surrounding them in a mystical haze. Wegner, over 100 years after Mill, comments on the same process as a form of reification that involves the participation of others who turn what was a constructed process, a constructed, a social construction, into an object that lies outside of this process, such that over time this experience of doing reification, says Wegner, is congealed into thingness. In reflecting on Mill and Wegner's insights so many years apart, I now enter into this dialogue by reflecting on Mills and Wagner's insights and those of methodologists I use um, in, my, in my own research and writings, those folks I really admire, to begin to look at the process of reification. I use this process as my starting point from which to interrogate my current uneasiness with what I perceive as the growing tendency, and it's growing by leaps and bounds as we speak, of the concept of mixed methods um, by turning it into an object, turning it into a thingness. I will discuss what I perceive to be some of the critical moments in the contemporary life of mixed methods, which is about the last 20 years that has served to propel the thingness of mixed methods process forward. And that what I see as some of the real negative impacts, there have been some positive outcomes depending upon your positionality, this process of thingness has had on the field of mixed methods research. But I want to talk about my uneasiness with it. One of these pieces of uneasiness is the delinking of theory and method. What I call moving towards a mixed methods centric approach, a method centric approach. What I also see is the lack of, in many cases, integration of the methods. We say we're mixing methods, but then we don't mix them. But we still say we are mixing them. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, and we're not sure what we're mixing. Sometimes we mix analyses. Um, it depends. It's not always clear what we're mixing, if at all. In, in fact, that, uh, Margaret Sandolowski has written a recent editorial talking about mixed up mixed methods. Um, and in some cases, I guess, leading to thingness is, is a kind of mixed up, in some cases, mixed methods, not in all cases. And I also want to discuss uh, some, you know, besides these integration analytical level issues, uh, issues that lie in the very teaching of mixed methods, which is worrisome to me. But at the same time, what I didn't realize in my own reading of pedagogy, at least in the US, is more and more graduate programs are requiring the teaching of mixed methods. But unfortunately, um, we don't have the personnel that have been trained or taken courses. I mean, most of the people that have learned mixed methods have learned it on their own. So we don't have that generation of teachers who have been trained. So we're in that kind of limbo, in that kind of liminal space, uh, where we're, we're having people that shouldn't be teaching mixed methods teaching it, because they themselves are having trouble with it. So you can imagine adding to the thingness problem and the mixed up methods problem. We've got it in the classroom, too, and I'll get back to that later. What is perhaps, though, the most troubling for me in thinking about the thingness problem in mixed methods is the tendency of the thingness, the thing, to stifle innovation in the area of mixed methods research as a whole. And I don't take this lightly. I'm not saying it happens all the time. I'm talking about trends that I perceive, that I'm reading about, 
and I'm going to talk about what I think is driving the thing, this problem. I almost feel in talking with you today that I'm coming out somehow about this issue. It's kind of scary. It's like I've become a character in the fairy tale, The Emperor's New Clothes. You know, where I'm the one to shout out, uh, the emperor has no clothes, you know what I mean? Uh, or as Norm Denson has written about randomized controlled trials and has written about the whole issue of the politics of evidence with RCTs, he calls it the elephant in the living room. The elephant that no one wants to talk about and the elephant is growing. I kind of feel, you know, we talk about RCT as the gold standard. I think what we're also moving towards, I would like to suggest, is maybe mixed methods as the next gold standard, which kind of is both a, a compliment and I have shivers up and down my spine thinking about it. So, you know, I don't expect you all to agree with me, but I have a point of view. I'm not trying to be dogmatic about it, uh, but this is what I perceive from my own standpoint and in the reading and involvement um, for many decades in the field. One thing I want to say is that reification itself is a process. I want to talk about doing thingness, how we're doing that thing. Reification is a process, a relational one, an interactional one. It comes about in a variety of relational happenings within a methods community. It happens amongst methods folks, sometimes, you know, qual and quant, sometimes your colleagues are mixed methods people, uh, but it occurs in a community of praxis. And um, there are a couple of folks that have used the term uh, ecologies of praxis. I think Savage and Rupert and et al. have, have talked about, you know, methods uh, training uh, is surrounded by a whole kind of uh, enchilada. You know, you're not just taking on the method, you're taking on everything else associated with the method. Often linking theoretical perspectives to methods. Uh, and so you're buying in not just to the praxis of the method, but all the other peripherals. It's almost as link, it's almost as if, if you're a positivist, you always do quantitative research. Well, positivists use qualitative data, but you wouldn't know it. Feminists use quantitative data, but that's always linked to qualitative data. It doesn't have to be. But we have this ecologies of praxis that we're buying into, that we feel like, well, I can't use that. I mean, we don't do that. Um, so it's something for you to think about. We as researchers enact verification within our communities of research practice. We need concepts, uh, of course, to allow us to communicate with each other. So we need a definition, definitional concepts. Um, concepts are neither true nor false, but can be considered useful or not among its users. So mixed methods and how it's defined, it's either useful or not useful to you. It makes sense to you. But what I'm, I'm not against using concepts. We need concepts in a field to communicate with each other. My point is that when concepts become rigid and their boundaries so tightly formed, they become, as Wagner notes, congealed into a thing. And it is this aspect of the concept formation to which I speak today. What is even more interesting to note is that we develop in our own minds a mental map. You know, we take that doing thingness and it becomes a conceptual mental map of our thinking about how to do methods. Um, it's the model of the thing that's inside of us now. We give it attitudes, attributes, we imbue it with a set of goals and promises such that we internalize it and come in turn uh, and to, to in turn, this mental model, uh, it, it becomes an object that is both inside and outside of us. Uh, and we give it this independent existence, but yet it exists within us. So to ask a quantitative person to become a qualitative person, you're not just asking them to change a skill, you're asking them to change their whole ecology and maybe their mental mapping of what it means to be a researcher, it's going to be hard to do. And it doesn't happen overnight. If you're trying to teach a student about mixed methods and their professor is quantitative approach and could care less, um, and you say we're gonna do it for a week, I'm not sure how much progress we're gonna get there. So um, I wanna go back, however, having 
said a little bit about um, the relational quality. I want to go back to tell you that there was a time in history, a strip of history methods, where mixed methods was used all the time. It was used all the time. Uh, it was used, but its practice was not consciously used. People didn't say, I'm doing mixed methods, one qual, one quad, yada, yada. Mixed methods research developed with the earliest of social research projects, even earlier. From studies of poverty within families conducted in the 1800s in Europe by Frederick Laplay, uh, Charles Booth, Roundtree. All these researchers did not call their approach mixed methods, although in their research praxis they use qual, quant techniques, including demographic analysis, survey data, participant observation, social mapping techniques. The Chicago School of Sociology in the 1920s similarly deployed urban ethnography, but it also utilized quantitative data. Robert Park, a core member of the Chicago School, applied mixed methods approaches to study inner city life in the city of Chicago concentric zone models. I mean, that's like GPS, right? I mean, he didn't have the technology then, but I could sure see those concentric zones, and he had them labeled, and he had a whole labeling of the city. He did mapping, different colors. He did visual sociology. He did almost anything. He just, just go out and figure it out. Use whatever tool you need. He didn't say, use mixed methods. One qual, one quant, one design. No, do it. Go out there. Learn. Don't restrict yourself. So the early deployment of mixed methods, unconscious, remained, you know, done. But it was, if it was at all conscious as multi-methods, it was used as what I call a loosely bound concept. What do I mean by that? That it was not specifically formalized in research practice. In fact, the practice of combining one or more methods for many people then, was not a new practice. It was like business as usual. Loosely bound concepts can provide the space for innovation of usage without demanding the researcher to stick to stringent conceptual rules, which we are, have moved to, by the way, I believe in the field of mixed methods we're moving to. Loosely bound concepts are also attentive to issues of contextualization meaning that the researcher takes into account the given social milieu within which the research project exists, for example, issues of racial, ethnic, gender differences, issues of specific cultural rules, and so on. Other contextual factors, such as disciplinary environment, are also taken into account. Loosely bound concepts allow for fluidity of meaning because they provide what I call wiggle room and defense against quickly reifying any concept's usage. They're fluid, they're flexible, they're turbulent. They're bounded loosely. There is also, remember, concepts are negotiated, they're, they're enacted. But a loosely bound concept is enacted by a process of negotiation and even contested dialogue around what's in and what's out of the concept's boundary. And there's a movement of the boundary line, an openness, awareness of honoring and working against binary thinking. Medical historian Elena Lowry in 1992, that's where I was introduced to this term, loosely bounded concept, when I was studying my genetic testing study. She argues that utilizing loosely bound concepts are important because they allow researchers, quote, to communicate with one another, especially across disciplinary borders, and are also important in fostering interdisciplinary research, which mixed methods desperately needs. She notes, quote, loosely band, uh, defined concepts, uh, which precisely because of their vagueness are adaptable to local sites and may facilitate communication and cooperation. They make possible the interaction of distinctly scientific cultures and thus permit the construction of a given segment of knowledge, while on the social level they facilitate the development of intergroup alliances and therefore advance the social, specific social interests. They're negotiable entities that simultaneously delimit de and link particular territories, the domains of professional expertise. They allow us to flex, to move, to create, to give permission to move in different directions. They're not up and down are two, only two motions you can, you can participate in. 
However, contemporary mixed methods, last 20 years of development, has seen more and more of the bounded usage become tightly bound. Uh, and this is where I want to begin with the contemporary period uh, in the evolution of mixed methods, meaning and practice. And you know, it's hard to date it exactly, uh, and everybody has their own date, but in the night from the, around the 1980s up until the present, we began to see things like mixed methods is the third methodological movement. I was thinking, wow, that's serious. Um, <laughs> Uh, Takashuri and Tedley's Handbook of Mixed Methods in Social and Behavioral Research came out in 1998 and the second edition 2003 and Takashuri and Tedley date the formalization of mixed methods back to the 80s with the emergence of mixed methods movement uh, to towards what, what, it, what they even say uh, a research paradigm, looking at methods as a paradigm. Like, that didn't make sense to me even at the beginning. I'm still trying to wrap my head. How can a paradigm be a method? But you know, in thingness, anything can go. Let's make it a method. No, let's make it a paradigm. Okay, I'll do it. I, I, you know, I'm talking to my friends, I reified it, good to go. You know, I'm teasing a little bit. Such a movement towards formalizing mixed methods was evidenced by the development early on, I didn't realize this, of guidelines for conducting qualitative and mixed methods research. The first iteration of guidelines, strict guidelines for mixed methods praxis did not happen in 2011, it happened in 1999. These were guidelines set by the National Institutes of Health in the United States at the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research. And while it focused on qualitative and quantitative guidelines, if you look in the back of that section, I was floored. Um, there's a section on mixed methods guidelines. I went, bingo, this is really incredible. Um, and the impetus, impetus, they said, for these guidelines back in 1999 was a growing funding interest in mixed methods research as well as disciplinary interest in the practice of mixed methods. So they began um, to offer some guidelines. I'm going to get to what's in these guidelines in a minute, but just to note that they went way back. Um, but what you'll notice during the 1980s to mid 20s, uh, 2000, there was a, also a growing proliferation of textbooks in mixed methods research. Well over 20 books published since 1988, and that number is growing. And the definition of mixed methods in some popular books and articles is defined, as I said, combining qual and quant. And the number of these methods, um, texts, and journal articles just continues, continues to grow. Now, if we go inside uh, all of these um, fat, all of these thingness development, um, we're going to find uh, several factors that have propelled the thingness problem. The first is the movement of mixed methods, especially in the textbooks to design-centered mixed methods. The first thing you focus on is the design. Which design do I pick? This one, this one, this one, or that one? Uh, so I want to argue that the movement towards formalized template mixed methods designs was one of the factors propelling thingness. The unexamined assumptions in the field regarding the prior synergistic power of mixed methods was another thing that propelled it. The premature moving of the field of mixed methods to best practice guidelines was another thing. Um, and to, when I say synergistic, I mean a priori two methods are better than one. Why would you use one when you can use two? Who wouldn't want to use two? Maybe three or four, maybe 10, I don't know. More is better. Um, I'm joking a little bit. And, <laughs> But what we began to see was other things happening to other methods, like the marginalization of mono methods. Maybe the dealer, you know, the, the you know, denigrating of qualitative methods, some argue. And maybe the privileging of positivist methods, in the beginning at least. So these factors 
all seem to congeal together uh, to, to begin the process of deeply bounded conceptualization mixed methods. So how do I know this? Um, and so one of the things I want to talk about here is design as method versus design as logic of inquiry. These are two separate things. And let me give you an example of what I mean. The research design as logic of research inquiry is more than a focus on the methods of inquiry. It doesn't give you a set of templates and the first question you get is, these are the designs. These are the ones you can use. Not that they, they say these are the ones you can use, but it's very design-centered, very design-centric. Uh, it involves you know, a range of asking yourself a few simple questions. Which design? Uh, the timing, you know, uh, the priority. Valerie Janicek would look at this kind of notion of design uh, and say, you know, that's not what I mean. Um, she has a conceptualization of research design, um, and she reveals how iterative the process is. And let me give you an example of what she says about her conception of what a research design does. For example, she says, when I studied deaf culture in Washington, D.C. over a four-year period, my basic question was, how do some deaf adults manage to succeed academically and in the workplace, given the stigma of deafness in our society? This basic question informed all my observations and interviews, and let me, uh, allowed me to focus on the basic questions uh, informed, uh, that informed all my observations and interviews, and let me use focus groups and oral history techniques later in the study. Both the focus groups and oral histories evolved after I came to know the perspectives of deafness of the 12 uh, hist uh, individuals in my study. She says, I use this example to illustrate the elasticity of qualitative design. Neither could I have I realized at the beginning of the study the value of the incorporation of these techniques. These techniques allowed me to capture a richer interpretation of participants' perspectives on deafness. What she's saying is, what do I want to know? What am I interested in? What are my questions? They're going to lead me to my design. They're going to tell me what to do next. It was interesting listening to Gary's talk um, yesterday. He was led by his questions. He reversed himself when he looked at what he found. He realized he was also asking the wrong question. Uh, it was something else in the data. So the data can form us, but we're led. We're led to know. Uh, we're not led by design methods. We're led by questions, a range of questions um, in our study. So did not design as method only ignores a whole set of design decisions that involve a tight link between research questions and methods selected. And while design as methods researchers, and this is important, design as methods researchers do mention theory. They mention it all the time. But it's usually the last thing they mention. A very telling, telling thing to me was I looked at a diagram that was done by some researchers you may know. And the first four columns of, of it was all about design as method. The last column was theory. And I'm thinking, how can theory come last? Unless you explain to me how it's last. So I redid it and I turned, I, I turned it around. I flipped it. I was flipping anyway, but I flipped it around. And I began to write in my own methods book, you know, we're putting the cart before the horse. That was the only thing I could think about. It's like, who's running this show anyway? And it's not, you know, it's not that we can't be led by methods. You know, I had a student that came to me, she, she said, you know, Charlene, I want to do content analysis. I say, okay, we know what method you want to use. Now, what question will lend itself to, to that kind of thing? You just can't ask any question. How many dissertation readings have I done? When I finish being a reader and I say, I have good news and bad news. You probably don't want me as a reader. The good news is uh, you answered a question. The bad news is you didn't answer that question. And they go, what am I going to tell my advisor? I go, I don't know, but you probably don't want me as a reader. Because <laughs> you just finished, right? Uh, but I'm, I can't tell you the number of times that people, you know, they just like bypass the question. Like, it takes a long to get. I, I spend all my time on what is it you want to know. 
and we do iteration after iteration to you finally sometimes you don't know what you want to know sure you can delve into data you can you can look at templates all of, I do whatever I can to like shake myself up but in the end getting a problem is not that easy um, and so we need to spend that time um, but here I open up some of these mixed methods books and I come to design and thinking I'm not ready for that and neither are my students I am not ready to teach you about design and you're not ready to know about it right now and they go listen which one do I pick A B C D and usually there are only three or four and I go I don't know what to do something's going on here and they need to know that this is linked to something you know like something comes before it something comes after it but this is the thing. The reason why it's allowed to be like that is that the default methodology is positivism. We don't need to know. We, are, we all know. It's confirmation. I use the qual, you know, as the handmaiden. Always the bridesmaid, bridegroom, never the bride. What can I tell you? I would like to be the bride occasionally. I need to. So I wound up writing a book, turning my head screw the other way on a qualitative approach to mixed methods. Everything was turned around. I was like, you can't have templates. We don't even know what the question is yet. How can you have templates when it's iterative? It doesn't work that way. You see where I'm going with this? Those are clues. They've got to be traces that it might be positivism, dressed in drag, so to speak. And Gidding said that in 2006 and started a big heated debate, but we'll get to that in a minute. So what my students were caught up in is diagrams, diagrams, diagrams. Then they got more complicated diagrams when they became sequential. Diagrams on implementation, the type, what do you want, qual quant, priority of importance, primary, secondary. Maybe it's not primary or secondary. Maybe it's in the middle. It's a binary. I'm uncomfortable with it. Why, you know, okay, then that's dominant equal. Oh, dominant equal. What is that? I mean, what is it always, you know, what, what are those are my choices? You pick them. I was like, gosh, <laughs> I'm having a hard day. <laughs> That's what I was thinking when I was writing this qual methods, uh, mixed methods book. Integration. Is it concurrent or sequential? Do you want them to come together? Well, they're not always concurrent. They don't always happen at the same time. Like, so my students said to me, well, Charlene, if it happens like a day later, is it like sequential? I go, oh my god, I have a headache. What am I going to tell her? I was like, I'm trying to fit something, retrofit it into something that doesn't work, and I'm really trying to work with it. And they're having a hard time working with it, too. Uh, sequential. What about when I did the project, you know, two years later, Shirley? Is that sequential? Like, I decided two years later that I needed to do a follow-up study, but taken together two years apart, and also I didn't have the money, and I, yeah, yeah. is that still sequential? Like, can I then bring them together two years later or five years down the road? I'll have to consult with someone who I don't know to try to figure that one out. And I'm thinking, we're so dogmatic about these things. We, we, we try to look at it in real life, and it doesn't seem to always go that way. It looks real simple, and that's the seductive part of templates. And in some ways, here's the positive part. And then the negative. The positive part is if you're lost, you got a template. It's like your lifesaver. You cling on to that, to that, to that um, thing. <laughs> and that thing's keeping you afloat, and it's helping you do mixed methods. And you're riding that wave, and you're feeling so good because you tell people what you're doing. I'm doing mixed methods until it bursts open and you find yourself sinking because you don't know where to go. You got all this data. Qual, and, you know, said qual, one qual, one quant. Okay, now what? Oh, nobody talks about integrating data. We hadn't done that for like five or six years in the field. So nobody was integrating anything. They called it mixed methods. The trick was what they did is they published them in separate journals. So they never came together. But in its lifetime in the beginning, it was mixing methods. Well, at the data collection stage, we collected them, but we didn't mix them. And I don't even know what mixing would mean at that moment. But mainly it was about data collection phase. But if we're mixing, wait a minute. 
why can't we mix methodological perspectives? Nobody was talking about that because, you know, theory was the default, you know, positive default methodology. Don't mess with it. Leave it alone. So my coming and saying, why can't we do a postmodern question together with a positivist question? Why not? They're answering different questions. We can still make them, they're not crossing paradigmatic divides, and they say, who cares? We'll use pragmatism. And pragmatism used as practical pragmatism. I'll get to that in a minute. So I'm thinking, um, we have to start, we have to start the re restart button. Like I wanted to start the restart button and take this apart because it, all this stuff was like coming at me. So what I realized is that if you're going to be, a, if you're asking a positivist question and you have an empirical project for the most part, uh, you, you would fit a little bit more comfortably in the kind of template world. But if you went outside of that and you didn't stay in that, you might have some trouble. And, for the, and the thing that suffered in lots of those studies was the qual component. Because uh, they might say, I did a qual, and when I asked what it was, well, they were the open-ended questions on the survey. And I said, you, you did that. OK, so what did you do with them? I just took some vignettes, you know, the ones I thought were cute. Oh, really? OK. Uh, so you cherry picked them. Oh, uh, well, you could say that. OK. Uh, but, you know, that's not what I mean by a qualitative approach. I said it's a long story. Have you had a course in qual? No. Uh, my professor said it was fine. It's mixed methods. OK. And I'm going, I, I don't know. I have a headache right now. <clears throat> Oh my gosh. So what I'm trying to say, you know, as Guest said in 2013 in a journal article in Mixed Methods Research, Journal of Mixed Methods, conducting mixed methods became deliberate, static, and mutually exclusive. We were in a rut. Now, I want to say one thing. There's nothing wrong about doing a positivist mixed methods study. I'm perfectly comfortable with positivism. I've used it a good portion of my graduate career. I've done work in it. I'm doing an a explanatory mixed methods design right now using surveys and then using the qualitative interviews as a secondary component. I hate that word. I don't know what else to call it. It's not for lack of saying it's useful, but when you can only be stuck in that kind of way of using it, and even then it's problematic with the qual, then I think we are stifling the kinds of questions we can ask, what we don't ask, what theories are favored or not favored, uh, what journals we publish in or do not publish in. And the reality is there are structural constraints that are placed that create thingness. Most journals are decreasing the number of words that they require that are required in their journal. How about 8,000 words to do a mixed method study? You can't do it. Uh, that used to be a research note. Now it's a journal article, 8,000 8, words. I tried writing a, squeezing a mixed method study into 8,000 words. I got maybe halfway through. So we have some other structural things. We have some other structural things that are impinging on the thing that's pro creating the thing that's problem. Evidence-based practice. You know, I know in the UK you've got an initiative called What Works for Austerity Policies. Um, and the what works approach is kind of like RCT in disguise, right? I mean, it's the, it's the coming of age of, you know, evidence-based practice. Uh, you thought you got rid of it, it's back again. Uh, but the thing is, um, mixed method studies cost a lot of money. And a lot of money meaning you have to do several studies, you've got to collect data, you have, sometimes have to wait. You want to do longitudinal data, you know, you need money. And, and policymakers, they don't want to wait, they want results. Did it work or not work? Yes or no? You say, well, wait a minute. We have to add the qual component to see, will it work? It may work in theory, but does it work in practice? And may have worked in the lab, but it doesn't work now. So what I want to say is we got a lot of things going on. Now, I can't go through everything I want to, but what I want to say is the impact of the design as method, a method as design rather, is in the classroom is the following things I've heard from my students. 
My study doesn't seem to fit one of these designs. What should I do? What am I doing wrong? What do I do when these different types of data, you know, what do I do with them and how do I mix them and which paradigm am I situated in? Am I in uh, like, uh, what paradigm, what's a paradigm and what do I do? Uh, how is it possible to exist in different paradigms? Uh, what, is par what, is, what is meant by pragmatism? Um, if these paradigms are opposing, can we mix these paradigms and conduct a mixed methods research study? Um, if so, which set of rules will our study be held to? Uh, I don't know. I have to consult with that person upstairs that does this. Uh, we have little guidance. Uh, I collected it. Now, what analysis should I use? Should they talk to each other? How do they talk? How do they mix? Alicia uh, Oak. O. Cathane in 2008 did a study of 81 mixed method studies. 25% integrated their qual and quan findings. She found a lack of reflexivity on the part of the researcher about like the purpose of mixing the methods. I mean, it was, it was not a great, a great support of integrating mixed methods. And uh, uh, Bryman has done a similar kind of study in 2006, 2007. Uh, so we don't have any guidance uh, for, for really how we begin to put these method, th these analyses together. We've got some great work done by Pat Beasley in this area. She's come out with a new book and several other things in the, in the works of how you begin to get methods to relate to one another, to integrate with one another. Uh, Janice Morse talks about this. But by and large, most of the discussion, dialogue, discourse, around integration still needs to be worked out. I personally, um, you have to figure out a definition of it. Um, I personally find it difficult to mash two methods together or mash findings together. Maybe I use the word weaving. I use the word informing each other. Uh, but I don't always use the word integration, except when I'm doing data transformation, turning a qual into a quant quantitative data and quantitative data and qualitative data, and then applying it to an issue. Um, but the other thing I think that has fueled it is the whole idea of mixed methods being synergistic. Uh, the idea in the literature was you put two methods together, you get synergy. And what I found in the writings when I went to mixed methods textbooks, and I went to Amazon.com, I looked at all the best-selling books in mixed methods across the decades. It's a convenient sample that I took. And these, this is the sampling of what I found. Multiple methodology simply constitutes a more adequate science. The use of quantitative and qualitative approaches in combination provides a better understanding of research problems than either approach alone. Mixed methods research, quote, recognizes the importance of traditional quantitative and qualitative research, but also offers a powerful third paradigm, there you go, choice that often will provide the most informative, complete, balanced, and useful research results. Well, maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. I'm not against the notion of synergy, but synergy just doesn't happen. It looks like RCTs, you sprinkle fairy dust, i.e., you sprinkle RCT on an intervention and it works. Uh, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But there's a kind of gold standard mentality to some of these comments about mixed methods. Uh, and this is the idea of the weakness logic argument. Um, the combination of both approaches can offset the weaknesses of each approach used by itself. And there's a great article by Simmons and Jorad that says, you know, even if we assume methods have weaknesses, the combination does not compensate for weaknesses necessarily. No empirical demonstration of synergy is ever given. It's stated in a universalistic way, but there's no particularistic discourse about how it occurs. No reconciliation of incompatible philosophies. No demonstrated mode of synergistic action. I'm not saying there's not synergy in mixed methods, but you gotta spell it out for me. Um, and what's happened is we've, we've jumped on the synergistic bandwagon. We've jumped on the mixed methods bandwagon, and the wagon's going on down the street we're rushing to use mixed methods. We're messing ourselves up. I mean, there's a skills gap issue. Our students barely know one method. We're asking them to do two in a short period of time. 
The theory gap issue, how much training have you had? Do you know these methods you're using? You know, what questions are you asking of these methods? Can you give me a rationale for why you're using this method and this analytical style? And they say, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, no, but why are you using um, a survey combined with an ethnography? Which, which question is being answered by what method? Oh, I don't know. Maybe both, I guess. I'm not sure. We have to go back to the drawing table. They've already gone and collected data. They want to collect more of it. I say, you know, qualitative data is not like a survey. You have to, like, collect it a little bit, and then you go back, analyze it. It doesn't work the way surveys work. I already mentioned the degrading of the qualitative component. And, you know, Jan Moore says, I love what she says this, maybe all you need is one method. Honestly, maybe all you need is a good in-depth in depth. Don't go across, go deep. Dive deep. Um, and especially if you're not sure what the question is, dive even deeper. So does mixed methods practice synergy mean better research? Uh, greater, is it greater than the sum of its parts? Is it open to empirical verification? Can you show it? If you can't show it, don't claim it. It's good marketing to claim synergy. I mean, the number of mixed methods books that were flying off the shelf went with synergy in them, man, that was synergy. Synergy is a promissory science. It promises, but does it deliver? Why can't you get synergy with one method? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But I have an audit trail to show you and to verify what I did find. I'm not so sure I know what verification means when I'm using two different methods from two different paradigms. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what validity looks like. We need to work that out fully. I don't know what it means to do reliability. I don't know what it means to do good ethics practice since there's not been one, not been one article, except there's par par partially a chapter in my mixed methods book on ethics. Ethics becomes extremely complicated in a mixed methods environment, and we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to sample that well in a mixed methods study. <coughs> NIH, in the midst of all of this, decided to create guidelines and more guidelines and more guidelines. And the guidelines are the same four templates as they were in 1999. We haven't moved the field at all in the templates. These are the four you saw in 99, and these are the four you're seeing now. And it's all empirically based. The methods, the design comes before theoretical discussion. There's plenty of theoretical discussion, but they're still delinking de in the guidelines. The point of the matter is, again, you know, we're not tending to how these things go together, how questions, methods go together, how paradigms, <laughs> how, how ontology, epistemology, methodology, and method, and interpretation, findings and interpretation go together. We've delinked all these things together. Um, and that worries me. <clears throat> I won't go through that. I don't have enough time. These, I've talked about that. Now, one thing I want to talk about that's come along that is purported to solve the theory methods link problem, and that's pragmatism. How many of you have heard about the pragmatic approach to mixed methods? A few of you. OK. Well, the way I see pragmatism <clears throat> is uh, the kind of pragmatism that's on the marketplace right now is not the kind of pragmatism, I have to move through very quickly, that Dewey talks about and his colleagues. Uh, and I want to just take a few moments, because I think it's important, because lots of people are thinking they can solve the paradigm, in, uh, you know, incompatibility problem, the kind of one, you know, with a one-size-fits-all theory. Uh, but there's a, what I think the kind of pragmatism that we're using in mixed methods, the kind of popular pragmatism, is what I call practical pragmatism. This kind of call to pragmatism as the third way, the middle way, the workaround for combining conflicting views to get at the empirical assessment of truth. The best methods are the ones that answer the research question, independent of any researcher's assumption. What works? If it worked, who cares about the theory? It works. 
I was like, am I going out of my mind? Is that really what people are saying? I mean, honestly, I sometimes have to worry about this because maybe I'm reading it wrong, and if I am, let me know. Uh, but I got things like, um, pragmatism rests on the assumption that humans already have the capability to theorize. Yeah, I, I believe all of that. But the problem with this kind of practical pragmatism is it sounds great, because then you're like, I don't have to worry about theory. And you are back to theory again. I don't have to even think about it. Um, but this wor what works logic, it, you know, I want to follow up with the following question. Uh, who decides what works? Who decides what's best? Um, if we acknowledge that all knowledge is also based on power relations, um, you know, it's also a political issue. Kval, whom I really, really like a lot, K-V-A-L-E, he's done a, several books on interviewing. He's no longer with us, but his spirit is in this room. Um, Kval referred to this type of what works justification as a form of communicative validity. He, I want to quote him because it's very important to, he's very important to me. One in which he says, uh, those who might be thought of as experts regarding the particular research problem get together to be, to, um, uh, evaluate and debate and dialogue around claims or findings of the research moving toward the idea of intersubjectivity or shared consensus and meaning. It all sounds good so far. Communicative um, validity, um, he says, you know, sounds good, but you know, while not all the experts will agree, there's a sense that all viewpoints have been heard. But he said, what's the problem? Is that it's good in theory, but it doesn't work in practice all the time. Who's in, who's out? Who's in your group and who's not in your group? Who decides who's the in group? Who was in that group with NIH guidelines? Who's in and who's out? Who made the decision? We don't know that. That's all subjugated knowledge. Who got to decide on those designs? Who got to determine who was an expert? You know, what kind of ontology? What kind of epistemology? Who can be a knower and who can be, you know, and who cannot be a knower? These are critical questions to knowledge building and legitimating knowledge building. So the what works sounds good. Um, and pragmatism sounds great. Um, and I won't go into another, he calls pragmatic validation has the same problem. Uh, but will it work in the reality? Uh, will it work if we think we have a fixed community? Mixed methods, we're just beginning. It's a turbulent environment. New members need to come in. We need to welcome the diversity that's out there. Just some disciplines are not even aware of the kind of formalized praxis of mixed methods. They're slowly coming to it. But yet we have these guidelines that have already been set up, these templates. And like, um, you know, you're going to find this when you, when you arrive and you're thinking, I guess this is what I do. So we're reproducing that thingness and really shutting out, I think, uh, questioning, innovation, all of those things that that matter to me and others. You know, what's good evidence? Who chooses, val who chooses measures for validating? What evidence constitutes truth? How are disputes reconciled in a community? Is truth seeking a self-correcting process? Has mixed methods community reached the ability uh, to reach consensus? Are we, have we gotten there yet? My students are still messed up about what, what pragmatism means. Uh, Several of them said to me, I was told that pragmatism is the philosophical partner for mixed methods, yet they were, per they were perplexed by this. And one of my students said he went, he went to the literature and he found three different ways that pragmatism was defined. And he asked me which, way he sh which one he should use. And I said, I'll get back to you. I have to go upstairs. So what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? I've just given you a, a smattering of my perceptions. Uh, we need concepts. Obviously, we need to communicate. Concepts are critical. Uh, they help us communicate. I've already said that. But when they congeal into rigidness, into strict guidelines, I'm beginning to feel the thing. <laughs> when, <laughs> it's when we become unconscious that the thing is doing us in. <laughs> Uh, you know, the things inside us, we believe it, and we don't even have the perception to even look at our own selves. We need to do that. We need to dive deeper. Uh, we need some strategies for mindful thingness, <laughs> praxis, and be aware of the politics of knowledge. When reflecting on any discipline's concepts, maybe some of these questions. Who gets to determine how knowledge <coughs> is legitimated? 
What end does the project serve? What is left out? Who is responsible for challenging, reframing, naming each concept? You know, instead of maybe guidelines, why not transparency? Why don't we begin with transparency? Give me an audit trail. Tell me what you did. I mean, it doesn't then depend, if you didn't have one of those signs, uh, you know, like RCT, you don't use it, it's no good. And you know, they have that hierarchy of you know, best, method, best practices, RCT is at the top and you know, the others are at the bottom, you know who they are. But you know, before we just a priori define what's best, uh, let me know what you want to know. So we have to be transparent at these stages, the context of discovery. The research questions, how were they formulated, who formulated them, um, and the context of justification, what methods are deployed. And we have to advocate for transparency in the write-up of our methods section. What did you do? Very often, you know, a complaint of individuals trying to figure out what people did is they don't tell you what they did. The, the methods section for mixed, I did mix, sequential mixed methods design, boom, that was it. Uh, how did you do it? I mean, what did you do? And I analyzed the data using <laughs> grounded theory. I don't even know what kind of grounded theory is, if it's one size fits all grounded theory. And, uh, you know, SBSS, I guess. So let's try to, let's try to, let's try to work with at least transparency. Um, to counteract verification, well, I mean, of the bounded, two bounded type, reflexivity. Um, examine your own values, assumptions, strengthen they will strengthen the overall design. Realize that reflexivity, knowing yourself, you are, you know, you are the data collector very often, you are the analyzer. <coughs> you, you, right here. If you don't know what's going on in your mental model, uh, you need to understand why these questions, you know, if you're working for your boss, you know why. <laughs> and you're kind of trying to please his question, you know why you're doing it. But it's important that you, you are aware of your own positionality across the research process and address these biases at all points. I call it, whole, written article called holistic reflexivity. And it begins really the moment you begin to think about what you're doing. You know, analysis also doesn't begin at that stage of analysis. It begins all the time. It begins, even starts at transcription stage. You're analyzing all the time. You're theorizing all the time. Be aware of it. Don't just do it when you're supposed to do it. What do you want to know? What assumptions you bring to the project? How is the design linked? These are all kind of sensitizing questions you, that you be important to take account of. Um, this is the best kept secret in the whole mixed methods world. Um, methodology does not mean method. Uh, you know, methodology is more than method. It's method linked to a philosophical foundation. Um, it links you know, it links the philosophical substructure with what you want to know, with the question you're asking. Um, methodology is not method. Methodological perspectives are not method specific. Research questions are grounded in paradigms and so on. One of the things I think is an antidote to some of the thingness problem, personally, since we have a skills gap in in the methods world right now, and the way we're teaching it is not helping. We need to engage across disciplines and encourage collaboration to maintain the strengths in mono methods, to maintain and support qualitative research, to maintain and support quantitative research. I do not want to learn qualitative research poorly when I take on a mixed methods project. I want to learn, I could learn from an expert, and I can work with them and communicate with them. But maybe we have to start doing cross-disciplinary work together in teams so that I don't have to start all over learning a qual method I may do poorly for quite a number of years. So if we can take the strengths of our mono methods and bring them together in team-based research, which we now do not do well, which we now do not communicate with each other, another study done uh, by a group, I think, in the UK, um, noted that when teams come together, there's a lot of strife. Uh, you know, they say they're going to work together when they don't. They don't always share their findings. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, think about that whole territorial model and those ecologies of methods. Uh, we need to promote dialogue across disciplinary divides and so on and so forth. We need to build a vibrant community of research practitioners. 
Uh, the mixed methods research landscape is a growing community. Um, its members should uh, negotiate concepts and meanings that truly cause, cause us to be able to feel free to negotiate and honestly to disagree. Uh, and it's important for us to privilege the unearthing of subjugated knowledge. And to do any kind of disciplinary work, you have to work at the borders uh, where you're flailing, you know, you, don't, you, you're, you think, oh my God, I'm in this liminal space, that's a good thing. Um, but you need flexibility, patience, resilience, sensitivities to others, risk taking, a thick skin, and a preference for diversity and new social roles. I'm asking you to come out of your methods comfort zone. I'm asking you to come out of your mental model. I'm asking you to reach out to the person across from you who may be different, but you can work together. We need to learn how to communicate with each other in a more effective way. Uh, adopting multi-methodological perspectives, each different methodology can bring a different question, can complexify a question. We never talk about multiple paradigms, weaving them together, <clears throat> weaving different questions from different paradigmatic points of view into, you know, I remember re seeing one of the videos actually from, um, from this, um, uh, from this festival early on, I think it was um, Jennifer Mason, talked about faceted methodology. I think that was her. I, I started, I turned on the video. I always do this, I always go to different things. And I, I was mesmerized by her talk. And her whole point was, you know, she couldn't get into this integration thing. And I was like, I was sort of there. But what she, you know, she said, you know, you can think of, a, of each piece of information, each question, adding a different facet to the whole understanding. You know, it's like a diamond. I wish I had one more. I have a few. Uh, but the idea is that it becomes more brilliant. It becomes brighter. Um, and you're not quite sure how it worked that way. But when you did it, and you turn out the light, it shone brightly. It shone wisdom onto the problem. It complexified it, and that's a good thing. Triangulation is good, too. But, but, but complexity is great. Um, and you don't throw away the qual just because it doesn't agree with the quant. It wants to be a bride, too. It wants to be a groom, too. So let it shine. Uh, adopting this perspective means that you're both an insider and outsider, and we know how uncomfortable you're going to be. But that's a good thing. You need to get lost in order to be found. Um, and remember that what is best is not necessarily the way forward does not necessarily overcome the weakness of methods, does not necessarily prove its synergistic properties. Dialogue together. Communicate together. To dialogue means <clears throat> create ideas. To discuss means taking a specific action. To dialogue means tracing reasoning. Discussion means converging ideas. Dialogue means discovery. Discussion is arguing and debating. Dialogue means seeking multiple understandings. Discussion means holding and defending. Dialogue means playful, really playful, like the emperor's new clothes. Discussion is winning. Dialogue is consulting and listening to the other. Discussion is individualistic thinking. Iterative versus linear. And this is on a continuum. Sometimes we have to be linear. Sometimes we have to be iterative. Sometimes we have to be in the middle. There's no value judgment here, but what I'm saying is to know what you're doing, <laughs> and when you're doing it, and when it's best, and where you want to go on that continuum. Thank you very much.